welcome back. There are alarming questions about the safety of international air travel just over a year after the tragedy of Flight 752. All 176 people on board died when the plane was struck by a missile on a flight from Iran to Ukraine. Many were scheduled to fly on to Canada. And as Molly Thomas discovers, there are fears that not enough has been done to prevent a similar tragedy from happening again. It was early at Iran's largest international airport. Flight 752 was delayed. It was supposed to leave at 5.15 a.m. 176 passengers were tired and ready to take off. There was just one flight scheduled from Tehran to Kiev, Ukraine. She said, we are going to get bored, so I have to just close the phone. Shaheen Mogadam was on the phone with his wife, Shakiba. She was waiting for that flight with their 10-year-old son, Rosti. Shaheen was waiting for them in Nobleton, Ontario. I was thinking that, OK, I, I watch a movie, and then they reach to Kiev. Mm -hmm. We talk again. The region was volatile. A rocket attack on the Baghdad airport kills Iran's most revered military leader. And the Pentagon announced tonight that the attack was a US airstrike. Overnight, Iran retaliated with more than 15 missiles targeting coalition troops in Iraq. The U.S. Federal Aviation Authority issued a no-fly notice, and many commercial airlines changed their routes, including Air Canada, the only Canadian carrier that flies in the Middle East. Were you worried about the airspace? Did you tell your wife not to fly? I thought that if something go tough or in, the, in real action, they're going to close their space. But Iran did not close its airspace. And Ukraine International Airlines chose to fly. This is what unfolded. After nearly an hour delay, Flight 752 leaves at 6.12 a.m. It climbs to nearly 8,000 feet and is following its flight path northwest. It is transponding normally. But three minutes into the flight, the signal is lost. Security camera footage shows a first missile being launched and then hitting Flight 752, which knocks the transponder out, but the plane is still flying. 25 seconds later, a second missile is launched. This blow brings down the plane. Suddenly, my friend Hostro called. He said, don't be sad, but just in the news uh, said there was a plane crash. I said, what? He said the Ukraine is in the BBC news. A Ukrainian airliner was crashed shortly after takeoff from Tehran International Airport. Then I just, I didn't know what happened next. I collapsed. Well, it's a moment I will never forget. Francois-Philippe Champagne was getting the news in Ottawa. He was Canada's foreign affairs minister. I think at around 3 a.m., 3 to 4 a.m., uh, my phone rang. And the officer said, Minister, uh, you better wake up uh, because we have a plane uh, went down and there's a number of Canadians on board. Walk me through the next 24 hours. It's frantic. It's frantic because you know, I, I knew this would be difficult. Of the 176 people on board, 138 of them had ties to Canada. <sighs> now, only a burning vigil captured by an eyewitness in a nearby field. I, I cried with the family. I, uh, I went with the prime minister uh, to meet the families in and seeing the pain of the family. So that pain of the family remains in you uh, as you go through that. Canada severed diplomatic ties with Iran in 2012, naming the regime a state sponsor of terrorism. Canada views the government of Iran as the most significant threat to global peace and security in the world today. 
In 2015, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made a campaign promise to restore diplomatic relations, which never happened. People would know that we have no diplomatic uh, presence in, in, in Tehran. Canada is represented in, in Iran by uh, Italy. While families were still in shock and grieving, consular officials scrambled. Then the prime minister confirmed what many on the ground suspected. We have intelligence from multiple sources, including our allies and our own intelligence. The evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. Iran denied that claim for two days. They started clearing the crash site. Highly unusual, but not illegal. It drew international criticism. We've seen video, we've seen film of bulldozers can clearing you, the area. Can you make a judgment yourself? On Iranian state TV, we've seen bulldozers clearing the area. That doesn't normally happen after a plane accident, does it? Tech, uh, the accidents, plane accidents, are a very technical issue. I cannot judge, you cannot judge, reporters on the ground cannot judge, nobody can judge. Finally, after three days, Iran admitted on state TV that a military missile shot down Flight 752, blaming human error. <laughs> Protesters filled the streets of Tehran, outraged over the government's initial denial that a missile hit this plane. Foreign Minister Javed Zarif responded. The fact of the matter is they were lied to for a couple of days. Well, this was a very serious situation. So our military forces were brave enough to claim responsibility early on. Well, once you admit it, then comes great responsibilities. And we're going to hold you to the highest standard when it comes to that. Under international rules, the country where a crash occurs leads the investigation. Despite admitting responsibility, Iran would now investigate itself. Without a diplomatic presence in Iran, Minister Champagne flew to Muscat Oman, a middle ground to meet with his Iranian counterpart. So we had a very, uh, I would say, robust discussion, you know, stating very clearly where, where we stood and that we would insist on having consular access. We will insist that, uh, um, you know, the, the repatriation of remains would be in accordance with the wishes of the family. Do you trust Iran to be truthful about what happened? No. They just start lies, and then they wipe out the, the crash scene right after the crash. I think they started to uh, clean it up with the bulldozer and two, three hours after, and they finished out the same day. Ewan Tasker was sent to Tehran by the Canadian Transportation Safety Board as an investigator. So you come up to the crash site, what are you seeing? As any accident site is, it was quite um, overwhelming. So you show up and you see all these things and then you start imagining what happened and, and uh, it takes you a while to take a few breaths and, and, and then get back to the job. You kind of have to put that aside eventually, your, your, your thoughts of uh, the, the terror. But Tasker was denied an active role in the investigation and could only observe. Why can't we have access in an investigation like this that cost 138 lives that were, you know, tied to Canada? We petitioned right away as soon as we got to um, Iran, personally, in person. Uh, we petitioned there for uh, access. Uh, the, at that moment, they were a little uncertain, and then it, the, their certainty as to the no, anyways, became more certain over time. We understand, say, the state of occurrence can't appoint 30 different countries uh, act up status. We understand that reason. But we're one. For six months, the TSB also lobbied for full access to the black box recordings. You fly to Paris, mm -hmm. you're in the room with the black boxes, mm -hmm. but you can't listen to them? So again, at that meeting, one of the first things we did was push again for this uh, higher status so that we could, but, but still the answer was no, unfortunately. Wow, so just no at every turn. Yeah, essentially. And so it's always a challenge to play those two sides. Do I, do I push really hard or do I uh, try to push diplomatically and, and just try to get the, bet, the, the most amount of information I can get? And you're dealing with your Iranian counterparts. Was there a point in the year that you felt like they stopped listening? I mean, individually, they're, they're, they're very professional, they're very courteous, they're very competent, but it's the system. So we, we knew uh, 
when we were in Iran in that first week that they really didn't intend to go too far down uh, the road about explaining why the missile was fired. And that concerned us then. That concerned us two months later, six months later, nine months later, a year later. While Canadian investigators faced continuous roadblocks, a year later, another possible piece of evidence is being reviewed by the RCMP. A recording with a voice thought to be that of Iran's foreign minister, discussing the possibility that the downing of Flight 752 was intentional. A thousand possibilities to explain the downing of the jet, including a deliberate attack involving two or three infiltrators. Zarif called the recording fake, but Shaheem Mogadam, who lost his wife and son, feels differently. It happened by, by plan and by purpose. It's, inc it's impossible to be an accident. Seeking justice, Shaheen wants answers. Does Canada accept that the Ukrainian flight was terrorism act or war crime or not? It's a yes and no. It's a simple question. Coming up. The world community needs to take this a lot more seriously than they have. Deadly attacks at 30,000 feet. The families want to know. The world wants to know what happened. When W5 continues. Some of Iran's best and brightest were on their way to Canada. Students, doctors, athletes, even newlyweds. And 20 children with their families. These were the 176 lives lost when a missile shot down Flight 752. The crash sent shockwaves around the world, but it wasn't the first time a civilian plane has been shot down by a missile. In 1988, Iran was in mourning after a U.S. Navy warship shot down a plane taking 290 lives. In 2001, Ukraine accidentally launched a missile at a Russian airliner, killing 78. And in 2014, a Malaysian airliner was hit by a missile over eastern Ukraine, a region in conflict controlled by Russian-backed rebels. 298 people lost their lives. 25-year-old Jack O'Brien was on that flight. His parents were waiting for him in Sydney, Australia. I think we're still bewildered by what happened and still wanting Jack to come walking back in the door with his backpack on. Marin and John O'Brien lost their only son. I won't ha ever have the sense again that things are complete and life is basically good. There'll always be that emptiness, that, that hole in our lives. What went through your minds when you found out it was a missile? You know, we don't expect to get on passenger, passenger planes and fly and get shot out of the air. I mean, very early on, our then Australian Prime Minister described this as mass murder. Canadian journalist and global affairs analyst Michael Bacirkiu was in Ukraine when that crash happened. As a spokesperson for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, he went to the site just hours after the plane went down. And it was a chaotic scene, horrible scene. Uh, there were still small fires and ashes still. It was a very, very high temperature crash uh, zone. In the case of MH17, rebels fired an anti-aircraft missile provided by Russia. Below 32,000 feet, the airspace was closed, but above, it was open. And many airlines flew this route. In fact, in the seven days before the MH17 incident, 888 flights from 39 airlines flew through the conflict zone over Ukraine. Everyone knew that the uh, airspace was closed, but what was going on on the ground below that aircraft, uh, probably the uh, crew or the passengers had no idea. No idea that a Russian-made missile was hurtling through the skies. The deadly payload unleashed on MH17 is eerily similar to what struck down Flight 752 in January 2020. So it's called a Buk missile. And what it does, it basically, it's, it's very accurate. It reaches altitude, uh, close proximity to the airplane. It doesn't actually strike the fuselage. But what it does is it explodes outside the airplane, and then it 
showers the airplane with, with shrapnel, very high velocity, disables the aircraft uh, very quickly. Decompression happens, it loses its ability to maintain altitude. There's no escaping that what happened to MH17 was a tragedy that should not have happened. And it exposed a gap in the system. Tony Tyler was the director of the International Air Transport Association. After MH17 and the loss of 298 innocent travelers, there were questions about how this could happen. Air passengers all over the world may well be alarmed. What assurances can you give them that they are safe when they fly? This is an exceptional case. It's the first time that this, that a, that a peaceful civil air aircraft has been shot down by a missile from the ground like this. And we need to keep that in perspective. This kind of incident is, fortunately, extremely rare. But W5 found that since the Second World War, 50 civilian flights have been shot down, killing 2,127 people. While the international aviation community pledged never again after MH17, it happened again with Flight 752. As a special advisor to the Prime Minister, Ralph Goodale has provided Canada's ongoing response to this disaster. He issued this 74-page report. I mean, there was page upon page of unanswered questions. What does that do to grieving families? I mean, it, it's like there's no answers there. It reinforces, I'm afraid, uh, their very deep concern about getting to the truth. Why was that airspace uh, not closed? Uh, what steps did they take to um, alert those airlines that there was danger in the skies? And the international civil aviation community will have no assurance whatsoever that that airspace is any safer today than it was 14 or 15 months ago. No safer, because no one can order a country to close its airspace. That is up to each sovereign nation. Iran is taking the lead in this investigation. Isn't that a conflict of interest? Absolutely. When the cause of a disaster is, in fact, the military of the country where the disaster happens, then, in my judgment, the rules break down. Then you've got the country literally investigating themselves. Condemnation has come out from across the world, but what can we actually do to tell Iran this is unacceptable? The international community, I think, has to, uh, has to have um, um, real courage and backbone here. Uh, I think they need to, to, to address the defects in the process for the future. So when this sadly happens again, uh, we've got a better process internationally for investigating it. You admit there will be a next time. I mean, we are talking about passenger planes shot out of the sky. Why can't we prevent this from happening? Well, the, uh, the, the world community uh, needs to take this uh, a lot more uh, seriously than they have. Well, this is not only a failure of Iran, this is a failure of the international rules and regulations. Well, in many ways it is. Canada has proposed the Safer Skies Initiative. Among its objectives, stronger international cooperation and improved warnings. Do you think that can actually save lives, though? I mean, when we're dealing with rogue regimes around the world. By putting this regime uh, on the spot and, and making sure that they understand that the international community is watching, that we judge them by their actions, not by their words. Because lives were stolen. We're not gonna move on. I still wanna know, the families wanna know, Canada wants to know, the world wants to know what happened because time has stopped for people on that moment. The international community, by large part, I think has failed in its responsibility uh, or its ability to deal with this problem. Global affairs analyst Michael Bacirkiu has this advice. At the end of the day, when there is a conflict, active conflict zone happening, you don't fly over it, you don't fly near it whatsoever, and if you're on the ground, you don't take off. Disheartening for the families. The O'Briens are still grieving the loss of their son, Jack. You know, there's not many ways that I can be Jack's mum anymore, but one way is to keep advocating for the truth to out about what happened. The O'Briens are participating in the trial for MH17 in The Hague. 
Three Russians and a Ukrainian are facing murder charges for their alleged roles in firing a missile at Flight MH17. You don't get a chance to fight a missile at 33,000 feet that snatches your life away. So, we can try and fight for him now. For Shaheen, the memories are still raw. He still can't go into his son Rostin's bedroom, and he has renovated their home the way his wife always wanted. And she said, put windows everywhere. <laughs> so I, I cut all the walls and installed the windows everywhere. You know, we came from the sunny areas, yeah, as, you, as you know, we love sun. <clears throat> Refusing to wait on the Canadian government, Shaheen is suing Iran for committing an intentional and deliberate act of terrorism. W5 reached out to Iran's foreign minister, Javed Sarif, for comment. There was no response. You've been quite vocal against Iran. Uh, a lot of other families are scared to do that. Have you experienced threats? I, 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 I am under threat. They, they threaten me quite often every week but I have nothing to lose, so I'm not afraid of. I am going after Iran. Uh, for someone like me who lost almost all the plan and futures and family, so nothing left. So this is what I'm fighting for. If Iran does not provide answers, Canada has the option of imposing sanctions or taking the regime to the International Court of Justice.